Hi Year 5, I think this is going to be the last instalment of the Ice Monster with, written by David Walliams. Chapter 71, Smothering to Death. Willie led the three humans for many more miles across the ice, north, north, north. As night fell, the entire sky lit up red and green and purple. Wow, this is beautiful, said Elsie as she stopped still and looked up in wonder. The northern lights, they're called, replied Titch. You can only see them if you travel really far north. Well, I went to Yorkshire to visit my mum, Maud, and I never saw them, said Dotty. Titch shook his head. I mean, really far north. As far as I'm concerned, Yorkshire is really far north. It took me hours on the train. Now, where's the mammoth taking us? North, replied Elsie. North, north, north. Are there going to be any shops? asked Dotty. I don't think so, said Titch. I don't need nothing fancy, just a cup of tea, some sandwiches or cakes. No, just more ice. Shame, Dotty said. I'm getting rather peckish. They climbed to the top of a tall snowdrift and looked down into a valley. How much longer? moaned Dotty. Who? hooted Woolly. She pointed ahead with her trunk before galloping down the drift. Something tells me we're nearly there, replied the girl as she chased after her friend. Who? Who? joined in Elsie. Nearly where? asked Dotty. I don't know, replied Titch. He took her hand and led her down the drift. Ahead, Elsie could see something was sticking out of the snow. On closer inspection, she realised it was a flag, a British flag. Next to it were a series of pegs, marking out a large rectangular shape in the ice. It looked almost like a grave. This must be where they found Woolly, exclaimed Elsie. Who? hooted the mammoth, miming, digging with her foot. Why the blazes has a mammoth brought us all the way here, grumbled Dotty. There must be a reason, Dotty. Trust me, replied the girl. As if on cue, the coloured lights that were shooting across the sky descended to the ground. The wind whipped up the snow and soon it swirled all around, all around them. The four were in the centre of a spiralling snowstorm. It soon became impossible for Elsie, Dotty and Titch to keep their eyes open and they could hardly breathe. All they could do was huddle close to the mammoth in fear. This is the end, Dotty, spotted Tit as snow swirled into his mouth. I need to tell you that I... Tell me what? asked the lady. If you would just let me finish. Woolly wouldn't have brought us all out here to die, shouted Elsie. There must be good reason. The mammoth wrapped her trunk around the girl. Hoo! she cried. Hold me close, said Elsie. Please. This felt like the end. The storm moved in. The blizzard was smothering them. They could no longer see or feel or hear. Elsie just managed to prise her eyes open for a moment. Huge shapes were appearing out of the snowstorm. Look, cried Elsie. They were not alone. Chapter 20, 72, A Perfect Circle A dozen figures were emerging from the storm, as tall and wide as ships. Dotty and Titch struggled to open their eyes. When they did, the most magical sight greeted them. A herd of mammoths. I wouldn't want to have to clean up after all that lot, mused Dotty. Is this real? asked Titch. I don't know, replied Elsie, but it's beautiful. Who? cried Woolly. As if by magic, the snowstorm moved outwards from where the gang of four were huddled. They found themselves standing in a perfect cir circle of calm as... They found themselves standing in a perfect circle of calm as a wall of swirling snow surrounded them. Slowly, Woolly broke away from the humans and approached the herd. One of the mammoths stepped forward and reached out its trunk. Woolly did the same, and the two trunks curled round each other in the most loving way. All the other mammoths lifted up their trunks and let out a chorus of hoos. Teardrops ran down Elsie's face. They were happy tears. They were sad tears. Happy because she knew her friend was finally home. Sad because she knew this was goodbye. Woolly turned round and with her trunk beckoned Elsie over. Hoo! The girl took a deep breath and paced through the deep snow. Woolly wrapped her trunk round her friend and pushed her close to the much bigger mammoth in front of them. Elsie was scared at first, but the giant mammoth wrapped her trunk loving, lovingly around the girl. The three of them embraced. Immediately the girl knew exactly who this was. Woolly, it's so great to finally meet your ma, said Elsie, choking back tears. Both animals nodded their heads and let out tender sighs. Who? sounded the largest animal behind them. It was time to go. The herd turned to leave. The mother mammoth gently pushed her offspring towards the girl. There was just time for one last embrace. 
Elsie buried her head in her friend's fur and wrapped her arms around her. In return, Willie lit the girl's face with a rough tongue. It was a sweet, if slobbery, kiss. Elsie whispered into the mammoth's ear, I love you, Willie. I'm never going to forget you. You won't ever forget me, will you? Who? Willie sighed. Who? replied Elsie. The girl reached out her hand and stroked Willie's fur as the animal started to move away. This was the very last touch. Elsie watched as one by one the herd faded into the wall of snow. Willie looked back one last time and waved with her trunk and then she too disappeared. Tears rolled down Elsie's face again as Dotty and Titch put their arms around the girl and held her tight. The storm passed as quickly as it appeared, leaving the three alone on the Arctic wasteland. Part 4. Home. Chapter 73. Headlines across the world. If the long sail back to London was sombre, the journey up the Thames was anything but. All of London turned out to watch HMS Victory, which had seen off the entire British naval fleet make its way along the river. The news of the mammoth's adventures had made headlines all across the world. Folk lined the banks to wave and cheer, and this lifted Elsie's mood a little. During the long voyage, the girl missed her friend terribly. She had grown accustomed to the mammoth's smell and sound and touch. She yearned for her trunk to be wrapped around her again. It was like a part of her was missing. A month or more had gone by since they'd left London. The ice over the Thames had melted away, and HMS Victory made fast progress towards the centre of London. Despite seeing the obvious delight of the crowds, all on board were nervous as the ship came into dock. A pack of policemen, led by Commissioner Barker, of course, were waiting on the river bank for them. Don't you worry, officers, we only <coughs> borrowed the, the victory. Took her for a quick spin, the Admiral called over. Barker's face soured, his lip quivered in barely disguised rays, causing his tiny moustache to twitch. Our orders are to take you straight to Buckingham Palace, he announced. Her Majesty the Queen wants a word with you. The pension is all gold. By the sound of it, they were in deep, deep trouble. Chapter 74. A Fleet of Carriages A fleet of horse-drawn carriages raced across London to Buckingham Palace. Elsie sat between Dotty and Titch in the first one. Both grown-ups looked sick with nerves. Dotty pulled out a handkerchief and spat on it. Elsie, I just need to give you a quick wash. She then proceeded to furiously polish the girl's face. Get off me, yelled Elsie. You're meeting the Queen. When was the last time you had a bath? A what? That's what I thought. The fleet of carriages passed through the tall iron gates to the grounds of Buckingham Palace. Elsie, Dotty and Titch all pressed their faces up against the window to get a better look. Wow, exclaimed the girl. It's magnificent, added Titch. It could be fit for royalty, remarked Dotty. It is fit for royalty, said Titch. The royals live here. They must have come from a very rich family, observed the lady. The carriage stopped outside the entrance to the palace itself. A footman opened the carriage door and the three stepped out onto the red carpet. All the old soldiers put on their tricorn hats and white gloves and straightened their scarlet coats. They formed a neat line and marched into Buckingham Palace. Elsie's eyes were dazzled by the riches. Never in her wildest dreams could she have believed anyone lived like this. Gold and marble and velvet spread across every space. Oil painted sculptures and ornaments lined the hallways. She wanted to stop and marvel at every last one, but there wasn't time. Her Majesty the Queen was waiting. These are good dust, remarked Dotty. I've counted three cobwebs. Shh, shushed Titch. Eventually, a tall pair of wooden doors was opened by the Queen's attendant, Abdul. Her Majesty has been expecting you, he announced. At the far end of the room was a little old lady sitting alone on a chair with a blanket over her knees. Her skin was as white as snow, her dress was black and her white hair crouched on top of her head in a tidy bun. It was Queen Victoria. Unsmiling, she looked Elsie straight in the eye. So, you must be the urchin who stole my mammoth. Chapter 75, An Audience with the Queen for the first time in her life, Elsie was too shy to speak, so she just nodded. It weren't just her that stole the mammoth, the mammoth said Dotty. I'd done it and all. Don't forget your manners, hissed the Admiral. It's I done it and all, ma'am. Ma'am, not ma'am. It rhymes with ham or jam. I done it and all, ham, said Dotty. Tit shook his head in despair. 
And what gave you the right to break into the Natural History Museum, bring along its prehistoric animal back to life, and then set it free? Elsie looked down at her feet. Well, pressed the Queen. I don't know, ma'am, she replied. Well, you must have some sort of idea. The girl looked over to Dotty and Titch, who gave her nods of encouragement. Well, I, um, I suppose... Spit it out, child. Well, I, um, I looked at Woolly. I beg your pardon, who is Woolly? Oh, that's the name I gave the mammoth, ma'am. Queen Victoria gestured for the girl to continue. Do carry on. You see, Your Majesty, everyone was calling the mammoth a monster, but I looked on Willie as a friend. A friend? asked the Queen, incredulous. Yes, a friend. And like me, she seemed lost without her mother and father, so I wanted to help her, help her find her way home. The Queen listened and nodded her head. Looking at you, child, I take it you are an orphan. Yes, ma'am, replied the girl. I was left on the steps of an orphanage when I was a baby. I never knew me, ma or pa. The Queen leaned in. Do you know if they're out there somewhere? No, ma'am, I don't know if they're alive or dead. This hit Queen Victoria like a thunderbolt. She was overcome with emotion. Her eyes closed and she struggled for breath. Are you all right, Your Majesty? asked Elsie. The little girl broke strict royal protocol and stepped forward to hold the old lady's hand. Queen Victoria looked down at the grubby little hand holding hers. This simple act of kindness made a tear well in the old lady's eye. Here, use my sleeve, said Elsie, offering up her arm to wipe the lady's face. This made the Queen smile. You, child, are a very special young lady, said Queen Victoria. The little girl was rather taken aback. No one had ever told her that before. Queen Victoria opened her arms and folded Elsie into them. For a moment, these two people, separated by oceans of age, class and wealth, held each other tight. It felt like all the world had stopped. Thank you, child, said Queen Victoria. I needed that. We both did. It's been so long since anyone has given this old lady a jolly good hug. Being the Queen, no one ever gives you one. Any time, Your Majesty. The pair broke away from each other. Well, began the Queen, the whole world has been following this story in the newspapers, myself included. Little did I know what was behind this extraordinary adventure. A deep and special friendship between an orphan girl and an innocent creature who just needed to find her way home. Elsie nodded. That's right, Your Majesty. This story has moved me. Not least of all because of your incredible bravery. So I declare that some prize giving is in order. Munchie? Yes, Your Majesty, replied Abdul. Be a dear and bring me your my box of medals. Chapter 76. The Bravest. The Chelsea pensioners all stood proudly to attention. Now, I have something here for all of you, began the Queen, opening the shiny wooden box for my brave soldiers. And sailor, prompted the Admiral, Oh, and sailor, my apologies, Captain. Admiral, corrected the old man grandly. Well, I asked my commander-in-chief to look into all of you, and I was told you never rose above the rank of captain. The old soldiers all stared at him. Well, I, um, the man sputtered, I think there was some sort of mix-up, Your Majesty. Really? asked the brigadier. I'm the confused one, not you. Yes, I think when I was asked to leave the old sailor's home and arrived at the Royal Hospital, all the old soldiers just started calling me Admiral. Heaven knows why. There were murmurs of, You told us to call us that, big fat liar. I would love to stick that leg of yours where the sun don't shine. Sharks should have swallowed you whole. Does this pub serve any food? Did they indeed? The Queen was not convinced. Well, Captain, approach and collect your medal. Nervously, the man limped over to the Queen. Duff, duff, duff. As he saluted, Queen Victoria pinned the medal to his chest. As head of the British Armed Forces, I hereby promote you to the rank of Admiral. Retired. The newly appointed Admiral turned round and looked at the others smugly. Thank you, Your Majesty. Now get back to your place before I change my mind. Of course, Your Majesty, he replied, limping as fast as his leg would carry him. Duff, 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 duff. One by one, she called all the old soldiers up and pinned medals to their chests. Finally, it was Titch's turn, the soldier with just one lonely medal, the medal every soldier receives for service. Well, Private Thomas, began the Queen, I have learned that in your time in the military, it has not been distinguished. Despite serving in my army for over 50 years, you never rose beyond the rank of private. Somehow, despite being in some of the greatest battles in history, you failed to fire even a single shot. I don't like loud bangs, Your Majesty. Over the years, Private Thomas, you have been mocked for your stature. 
for this extraordinary adventure has shown that you are a giant among men. Do you know what this is? She asked, dangling a cross-shaped medal. Titch's eyes lit up. Of course, Marl. That is the highest honour a soldier can receive, the Victoria Cross. I rarely give these out. They only go to the bravest of soldiers. The Victoria Cross goes to you, Private Titch Thomas, and you shall henceforth be known as Private Towering Thomas. The Queen bent down to pin the Victoria Cross to his chest. Titch looked at it, his eyes welling with tears. Thank you, Your Majesty, as he turned round to face his comrades. They gave him an almighty hurrah. This just proves, if ever there were any doubt, that heroes come in all shapes and sizes, said the Queen. Private Thomas smiled proudly. Then the Queen turned her attention to Elsie and Dotty. Of course, heroism isn't something reserved for men only. Look at some of the great heroes of my reign. So many of them are women. Florence Nightingale, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson or Millicent Fawcett, to name but a few. So I'd like to award medals to you both as well. Dotty? The lady didn't move. Dotty? Me? asked Dotty. Yes, you are called Dotty, aren't you? Yes. Well, approach me then, please. Now? Yes, now. The lady curtsied with every step she took. Get a move on, ordered the Queen. Apologies, Jam. Queen Victoria rolled her eyes and went to pin the medal to Dotty's chest. Let me help your Queen, the Majesty, she said, all fingers and thumbs because of her nerves. Dotty managed to stab herself with the pin. Ow! Are you all right? asked the Queen. Yes, I'm fine. Ouch! Are you sure? I've just stabbed myself, but I'm fine, really, I'm fine. Owie! Dotty then retreated, curtsying again with every step. Now, last but not least, Elsie said the Queen. The girl curtsied respectfully, and she once again approached the old lady. Elsie, you have been the bravest of all. Living on the streets of London is brave enough, but you have been the driving force behind the extraordinary adventure. You did all this, not for yourself, not for personal gain, but to help, in your words, a friend. Elsie, you have shown uncommon valour. Queen Victoria reached into her box for the final medal. Then the girl spoke up. I'm sorry, I don't want to be rude in that, but I don't want a medal, ma'am. A gasp echoed around the room. Chapter 77, Never Forget. You don't want a medal, spluttered the Queen. Everyone but everyone likes medals. All I want is for you to help orphans like me, replied Elsie. The Queen thought for a moment. Well, after all what's happened, I can hardly hurl you back out onto the streets of London, can I? Then a smile spread across the old lady's face. All right, young Elsie, why don't you come and live with me here at Buckingham Palace? You can keep me company in my old age. A splendid idea, Your Majesty, remarked Abdul. All eyes turned to the girl. I've got twenty-five friends, she replied. Twenty-five, replied the Queen. Yes, they're all from the same orphanage as me. When I ran away, I promised I'd never forget them, and I haven't. What is the name of this orphanage? Wormley Hall, home for unwanted children. Sounds frightful. It is. And you ran away, Elsie? I had to, Your Majesty. The lady who ran it used to beat me black and blue. I had to get out, or she would have killed me. The Queen took a deep breath. She could barely believe what she was hearing, but she knew this girl was sincere. What is the name of this lady, if indeed the creature can be called that? Mrs. Curdle, Your Majesty. Hmm. Won't she? Yes, Your Majesty, replied Abdul. Have this Miss Curdle locked up in the Tower of London. With great pleasure, ma'am. A huge smile spread over Elsie's face. This story did have a happy ending after all. Sometimes it's wonderful being queen, said the queen. And won't she? Yes, Your Majesty. Send a fleet of my carriages to collect those poor orphans and bring them here to Buckingham Palace. All twenty-five of them, ma'am. The queen gulped. Yes, all twenty-five of them. We have the room. At once, Your Majesty. With that, Abdul bowed and left. Of course, child, tonight is a very special night, began the Queen. Is it? asked Elsie. After being at sea for weeks, the girl had completely lost track of the date. Yes, my child, it's New Year's Eve. At midnight, we welcome in the new century, as the year becomes 1900. Perhaps you and your 25 friends would like to join me for a midnight feast as we watch the fireworks. Yes, please, Your Majesty. Splendid. I'll have my team of cooks lay on the feast. I can't wait to see them all again and tell them this incredible tale. I'm sure they've missed you, young lady. Elsie smiled and turned to look at Dotty before addressing the Queen again. Your Majesty? Yes, Elsie. Please can my friend Dotty come to the party tonight too? 
She's really looked after me. She has been like a grandma, actually. I would love to see the new, year, new century with her. The Queen took a deep breath. Yes, all right, Dotty, you can come too. But please refrain from calling me Ham. Oh, thank you, Jam, replied the lady. Oops. Private Thomas was trying to catch Dotty's eye to no avail. When that didn't work, he gave her a sharp poke with his elbow. What do you want? I'm talking to Queen Majesty herself, the ruler of everybody and everything. Well, shouldn't the love of your life come too? What's that? Me! I'll ask, replied Dotty. She put her hand in the air. Victoria the Majesty? Y yes, replied the Queen uncertainly. Please could Towering Thomas come to the party? She asked proudly. I won't take up too much space. You'll barely know I'm there, Your Majesty, added the man. Queen Victoria sighed loudly. Well, I suppose there's always room for one more, she said. Thank you, ma'am, he replied. Just then the Admiral popped his hand in the air. Yes, asked the Queen. Ma'am, if I could be so bold, I have been an extremely close friend of Private Thomas's for many a year. No, you haven't, he corrected. Shut up, hissed the Admiral. And I would miss him terribly if I couldn't share this momentous night with him. The old Queen sighed. All right, should I bring my own rum? I'm sure we have a barrel or two. Splendid. But what will everyone else drink? Anyone else want to come to the party, she asked. All the old soldiers started nodding their heads enthusiastically and murmuring in agreement. Oh, yes. Is it a buffet or a sit-down thing? I can't stay too late. I really need to be back at hospital before midnight. Yes, 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 you can all come, exclaimed the Queen. Now please, everyone, leave immediately before I change my mind. You've never seen people exit a room so quickly. Chapter 78 Not a day goes by. Boom! Whiz! Kaboom! Fireworks dance in the sky over London. Those lucky enough to be on the top floor of Buckingham Palace had the best view. The elderly queen was hosting quite a party. There were 25 Wormley Hall orphans, all the Chelsea pensioners, Abdul, Dotty and of course the guest of honour, Elsie. Fittingly, a huge Victoria sponge cake was served. It was so big you could have dived into it, but it was demolished by the starving orphans in seconds. By the fireplace, Private Thomas got down on one knee to propose to his beloved. Dotty, will you marry me? Where are you? asked the lady. Here. Dotty looked down and spotted him. Sorry, I didn't see you all the way down there. Dotty, will you marry me? Oh, I forgot to rinse my mops out. Dotty, the little mum is coming out right now. Will you marry me? There's no need to shout, dear. Yes. The pair kissed as everyone around them clapped and cheered. Hurrah! Bong, 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 bong. Twelve bongs from Big Ben meant it was midnight. 1899 had ended and 1900 had begun. Everyone crossed arms and Queen Victoria led the singing of Old Lang Syne. Robert Burns' words and the mournful tune made Elsie think about Willie. She missed her friend terribly. As she sang, a tear rolled down her cheek and she stole away to the far side of the room so nobody would see her. Elsie didn't want to spoil the celebration for everyone else. Only the Queen saw that the girl was upset and she broke away from the rest. The unlikely pair of friends found themselves alone in the corner as fireworks illuminated from the window. What's the matter, child? asked the Queen softly as she placed her hand in Elsie's. The song. It just got me thinking about how much I miss Willie. If truth be told, old Lang Syne always makes me a little tearful too, replied the Queen. Her eyes, old eyes becoming misty. It always makes me think of my darling husband, Prince Albert. I lost him 38 years ago, but not a day goes by, not an hour, not a minute when I don't think about him. It sounds like he was a very special man. Oh, he was, child, he was, the most perfect gentleman in all the world. Elsie reached out her other hand to the old lady who held it tight. See those fireworks, Elsie? Yes, ma'am. That is how it felt in my heart every time my darling Albert entered the room. That's beautiful, murmured the girl. It was real. In the end, we've both loved, child, and been given love in return. What more can you ask of life? I suppose so, replied the girl. I know so, Elsie. You may look around this palace of mine, this country of mine, this empire of mine, which stretches to the four corners of the globe, and think I have everything. But believe me, child, you have nothing without love. The Queen picked up a glass of champagne for herself and handed a glass of lemonade to Elsie. To Albert, said Elsie. To Willie, said the Queen. Clink.
the end. Really hope you enjoyed that, Year 5. Maybe we'll do another book soon. <laughs>